Okay. So I'll start again in case uh, people didn't hear me first time. Adrian Howlett, thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm an estate planning consultant for McClure Solicitors. Um, we are an established solicitor. Um, we've been around since 1853. Uh, I've not been around since 1853. I'm a bit younger than that. Um, we have 15 offices uh, throughout the UK. We have one very local to you in Pall Mall in London. Uh, we've got another nine in, spread throughout England. Uh, our furthest south is Truro down in Cornwall. Uh, our furthest north is in Newcastle and, and many in between. Uh, we have an office in Cardiff and also four offices in uh, Scotland. And that's where I'm talking to you from today. Uh, I'm sitting in my house in the west coast of Scotland uh, with the River Clyde right behind me. Just to give you a, a picture of, you've got the River Thames, we've got the River Clyde here. You can tell from my accent though that I am not from this part of the world. I am actually a London boy myself. Um, uh, uh, my dad was in the forces, so we, we traveled an awful lot. I spent a lot of my childhood years in Southeast London. Uh, so for my sins, I'm a Charlton Athletic fan. So hopefully we've got a few other Charlton fans on today. If not, uh, fair enough, I'm the only one. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you today, uh, as, they, as Primula said, about uh, wills and power of attorney. Uh, we call that estate planning, and that's what we as a company specialize in. Uh, we specialize in estate planning for private clients. Uh, estate planning effectively is getting yourself in order. And I actually entitled this uh, talk, Getting Your Affairs in Order. Um, are you ready? Um, and getting your affairs in order doesn't mean uh, your, your affairs with uh, other partners. It is meaning your legal affairs. Uh, and getting uh, wills and power of attorneys, trusts, uh, inheritance tax planning, etc., in, in place. Um, normally, I would talk about a lot, a lot more things today, but we decided just to keep it nice and simple with uh, wills and power of attorney. Um, I will talk a wee bit about trusts because they are linked into wills. Um, and then at the end of the, the talk, uh, I'm more than happy to take as many questions as you wish to fire at me. Needless to say, uh, we support a lot of clients. Um, once uh, a client comes to see us, uh, obviously we can do other work as well, like probate. We can do conveyancing uh, and we also do estate agency. Uh, that's a bit unusual in England, but in Scotland, the majority of estate agents are solicitors. So that's how we've come about to, to do estate agency. So um, we've just recently partnered with Countrywide. So they now look after our estate agency uh, uh, throughout England, Scotland and Wales. So that's a, a brief introduction about who I am and who McClure's are. Um, what I now will move on to is uh, Wills. Wills. Um, I normally ask a question, normally I'm in a room with you guys, so I could, I could actually feel for you and I could I get reactions. It's, uh, it's a different world, isn't it, with, with Zoom? But I, I, I normally start off asking a rhetorical question, who has their will in place? Uh, you don't need to respond to that because I don't want to embarrass anyone that doesn't have their will in place. Um, but anyone in the room effectively knows uh, that we should have a will. Um, the Probably the reason for that is because a will involves uh, looking after leaving your estate to people, or more importantly, you get to know about it first because you receive uh, money from someone as a beneficiary. So everyone knows and understands what a will is. Um, unfortunately, for some unbeknown reason, uh, the majority of UK adults do not have a will. Uh, it's quoted about uh, 65, 70 percent of adults do not have a will in place. Um, so I suspect of the people in the room today, uh, there'll be some of us uh, that haven't got wills in place and there'll be some of us that have got wills in place. For those that don't have their will in place, you're normal, by the way, because you're you're sitting in the majority uh, and people like myself that do have my will in place, we're, we're the minority. Um, but hopefully after today, uh, you'll all be thinking about this and putting this on your agenda if it's something you haven't done yet. As Brumella quite rightly said, um, obviously I'm talking today from McClure Solicitors. Um, we work with uh, St. Joseph's Hospice, which is local to you guys. Um, we've partnered with them for many years. Um, and uh, obviously, I, I think it was because of that relationship that we're making this talk today. Um, so if you do uh, need to get your will done, um, you can certainly uh, leave a, a donation, which I'm going to take a minute to, to the hospice um, for, for their good work. Or obviously, you can leave it to the city and uh, Hackney Gerris Trust. So what is a will and what's involved? 
So a will is basically a wish of where you want your assets to go. Note I used the word wish there. Uh, I'm going to give a bit more detail on what I mean by a wish uh, a bit later. Um, effectively, you're going to give your details, your personal details, uh, uh, name, address and, and date of birth for, for the will. Um, and then the first thing you're going to decide is who is going to be your executor. The executor is the person that executes the will when you pass away. Uh, and it's normally going to be a close family member or someone that you trust as a friend if you don't have someone in, in the family to look after it. So I use myself as an example during the talk. I'm married and I have three children. So my executor is my wife, Liz. Uh, and uh, basically that means that if and when I die first, which is probably likely because I'm the, the male, uh, and the male tends to die before the female, um, not always, but some most times, um, that means that she executes my will uh, and she signs things off uh, when I die. It also means um, that uh, she coordinates uh, probate, etc. Uh, she can do that herself, or more likely she'll probably instruct the solicitor that, that wrote the will uh, in, in the first place. Um, what I would also recommend, so if I'm writing your will for you, um, I get to know you first. I'll spend a, a 15, 20 minutes talking to you. I will get to know about you and your circumstances. Um, and then uh, I would then dictate what I think is best for you in your circumstances. So in my case, I'm going to put my wife as my executor and then whom failing, my uh, eldest child as, as a reserve executor. So that means should Liz not be here, when I die, because she dies before me, then that means my eldest child will be the executor for, for, for the will. All right. So that's an executor, the person that executes the will. Um, and then the next thing, the next big decision you're going to take is who is going to benefit from your estate. And your estate is effectively the, the money that you build up, the assets that you build up during your lifetime. So as an estate is made up of your house, your property, if you have one. Um, or properties, if you have more than one. Uh, it's also made up of all your money that's in bank accounts and savings. Uh, you might have premium bonds, you might have share certificates. Um, so that's uh, your estate. Obviously, any money that you've got sitting under the, 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 the duvet or the, the pillow or somewhere else that you hide your money, because um, it is, is, is known that people do that. Um, so that's, all, that's your estate. So effectively, uh, when you die, the executor advises the, the solicitor that the, the the person's passed away and then we gather in the estate that's what we call it we're winding up your estate um, so you then decide from that estate who is going to benefit of that estate so again if i use myself as an example i'm going to leave all my assets to my wife in the first instance um, and then when she dies it's going to split equally amongst the three different children OK, I'm just getting a message there saying having microphone problems today, I might need to pop out and come back in. Sorry, um, that's uh, from Donald. So hopefully, Donald, you'll get yourself sorted out. And we'll see you back soon. Um, so effectively, I'm going to leave everything to my wife and then who's going to my three children. And then we add words into the will, the Latin words, posterpes, which basically means that uh, it goes down the bloodline. So if I left... If I left everything to my uh, three children, my wife's passed away, um, and then let's say for argument's sake, my son predeceases me, he dies before me, um, the money that goes to him would then go to his children. Okay, so we think about that all for you, and most listeners will do the same for you. They'll, they'll work that all out for you. You don't need to let them know that. They'll just ask the questions, you'll just give the answers. Okay, so that's the, the beneficiaries. There's different ways that you can give money to a beneficiary. Um, there are uh, various ones. The most popular uh, are a residuary beneficiary, uh, and the next one is a pecuniary, which is a cash. So what you might do, uh, for example, is um, I'll give you an example. A client I met down in Brighton, um, she wanted to leave nearly all her money to charity. She didn't have any children, but she did have a niece and nephew. Uh, and when we talked about it, she says, oh, no, 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 don't worry. He's got loads of money, as in her brother had loads of money. Um, so they'll be well looked after. After us chatting about it, I then made a think, you know, would you like your niece and nephew to at least think about you when, when you die? Um, so you might want to leave just a small amount of money for them. Now, that's a really good idea, Adrian. I think I'll do that. 
Um, so we left pecuniary legacies in her will. So it basically meant a, a cash amount. So I can't remember the exact amount, but it was probably a thousand pounds each uh, that she left for, for each of those two children, um, to her niece and nephew. Uh, and then basically the, the balance then goes into the residue and out of the residue, um, effectively the, the whole amount went to uh, the, the charities that she had chosen. Um, so that's the difference. You can have a pecuniary legacy, which is your cash, and then you have your residuary legacy, which is a percentage or a part. Um, just bear in mind, uh, depending on how much cash and assets you have, that when we wind up an estate, the first three things that we pay out are any debts that you have. Um, the next thing we pay out is any funeral expenses. And the third thing we pay out is the legal fees involved in, in winding up an estate. Uh, the next amount that goes out is the pecuniary legacies, the cash legacies, and then whatever's left, we call the residue, and that goes out to the to the people that have the, the percentage residues, just so you understand how, how it works at, at the end, okay? Um, you also might want to consider um, when you're writing your will that, that you might want to leave what we call a gift in will. Um, that is basically leaving money uh, or, or, or residue to a good cause. Um, the good cause may well be uh, a charity that you support. Um, it might be the, the Hackney and the City and Hackney Carers Trust. It might be St. Joseph's Hospice. It might be uh, British Heart Foundation. If you've had uh, someone in your family had problems with hearts in the past, or uh, there's many, many a charity that, that you could choose. So um, that's called a gift in will. Again, you can leave that as a cash amount or a percentage. So for example, you could say, I'll, I'll leave 99% to my family and then I'll leave the other 1% uh, to uh, the good cause or charity that I support. Um, so that's a, a gift and will. It's something that a lot of our clients leave. Um, of last year, about 40% of our clients that came to see us to write a will left a, 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 a gift and will to, to a charity. And that equated to 38 million pounds, uh, just to give you a, a, a feel for what, what, that, what that means. Some other things that you might want to uh, think about when you're writing your will um, is, uh, and we'll talk to you about this, so you don't need to, to worry about it, because um, we're basically getting to know you, we get to understand how you operate. Um, we would uh, look about things like guardians. Um, so if you had children under age, we can look at guardians for children. Uh, also, uh, we, uh, I was doing a talk last week to another group of carers, um, and one of the ladies that was in the, in the uh, group um, she owned the property and her partner was not uh, on the on the title deed, so he didn't have any ownership uh, rights. Um, so in that situation, uh, I would obviously find out what her feelings were of the partner. Um, and if uh, she wanted him to stay in the property, I would then put a right to occupy in, in the will. Um, so we would think about all these things as, as individual items. Um, very rare to have right to occupy a will because most people joint share, uh, joint own a, a property. Um, but we'll pick up on things like that for you. Um, the other thing you might want to do is consider what your funeral instructions are. It's not a funeral plan. It's just purely dictating uh, that I would like my body to be cremated or buried. Um, and we put that in. Uh, and if you want to use a specific uh, undertaker, we can put that in as well. So that's basically what a will is. A will is a wish of where you want your assets to go. Um, if you don't have a will in place, um, this is a good opportunity now, sort of a wake up call to, to think about that and get it sorted. Um, you, the, the issue with not having a will is that you're not gonna know where your estate goes when you die, because obviously uh, you then die what's called intestate, and it's then the law that decides where the assets go. Um, so my advice is if it's something that you've been meaning to do, um, please do it. Uh, don't put it off. Um, I regularly attend shows. Uh, I go to Olympia quite a lot for shows. Uh, the uh, Alzheimer's show is an example. Um, and it's quite common for people to come up to the stand. Uh, we have a wee chat. Um, I obviously talk about what we're talking about today. Um, and most people are, are, are very good. They're very interested. And then you get the odd person that says, oh, no, no, Adrian, don't, don't, don't want to do a will. That means I'm going to die. I said, mm, not quite. I said, I did my will many, many years ago and I'm still standing here talking to you. Uh, so by writing your will doesn't dictate you're going to die tomorrow. Um, uh, but uh, I understand your feeling. You know, people have people have to get to a trigger point. They have to want to do it. Um, so uh, I normally finish by saying, well, that's not a problem. 
I've did, can you just do me a wee favour? And I hand them a pad and I hand them a pen and I say, would you just write on there your name, number and the date you're going to die? And then what I'll do is I'll ring you a month beforehand and we'll get it all sorted. And they look at you and they go, hmm, that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, we do not know when we're going to die. So uh, please, please don't put it off. If it's something you've been meaning to do, please, please, please do it. Um, why would you want to use McClure's listers? Well, we've been doing it a long time, 167 years. Um, uh, and also we do what we call a, a three-step will. Um, the first step is who is going to get your estate when you die. That's the beneficiaries. Uh, what effect, number two, is what effect will that legacy have on the beneficiaries? And step three is where would your estate likely end up? Okay. Step one, who's going to get your estate when you really die? That's quite normal. Most people uh, in the UK that are writing wills will do step one because that's what a will is. Okay. So we all do exactly the same there. What a lot of will writers and solicitors don't do is consider what might happen in the future. And that's what we do. We, we, we think about what effect it will have on the beneficiaries and where the money might end up. To put this into reality, um, I'm going to tell you a wee story about a, a, a real client or was a real client because unfortunately they've died now. Um, but we had uh, a client come to see us. Um, her dad uh, had just died. Uh, he had just turned 100 uh, when he died. She was in her 70s. Um, and she came to us to say, would you mind sorting out uh, my dad's uh, probate? Um, yeah, of course we can do that for you. That's not a problem. Uh, pop into the office, bring the papers with you and we'll, we'll run through it. So that's what we did. Um, we established before we even talked about dad's estate that she was worth uh, 400,000 pounds. That rings alarm bells for me straight away uh, because I already knew by this point that she was single and she had no children. So effectively, she's got a lifetime allowance of £325,000. Basically, we all in this room have a lifetime allowance of £325,000. If we die with an estate more than that, uh, effectively, you're going to pay 40% in, well, not you, your executor is going to pay 40% inheritance tax on any excess amount. There are exceptions to that, which I'm not going to go into today because I'm not not got time to do that. But effectively, if you're married and you have children, you do get allowances that increase that amount. OK, um, so she told me she had four hundred thousand pounds. So I knew she was single. I knew she had no children. Um, so that meant that when she died, bear in mind, she was in her 70s. Um, she already has a tax bill or her executor is going to pay a tax bill on, on the excess money of seventy five thousand. So that meant effectively every penny that was coming from her dad would be taxed at 40 percent if she didn't spend that money before she dies. Um, she didn't spend a lot of money, so it's highly likely that would have happened. So in her case, what we did is what's called a will trust, um, a testamentary trust plan, um, whereby we rewrote his will, which we're allowed to do because she was agreeing to it. She was the beneficiary. And you have a two year time period in which to do that. So from the date of death, as long as we do that within two years, it's called a deed of variation. We could amend that will and effectively rewrite it to make it a will trust. So basically his £150,000 that he has in the state, we put that into the trust and it now sits in what I call a cloud and it just floats. Um, in Scotland, it floats forever. In England, it floats for 125 years. Unless you take it all out, then it dies, obviously. Um, so we set up that will trust. Um, and that meant that the money was protected for her going forward. Why would we want to do that? Well, effectively, what we didn't want to do was pass on his asset to her directly, and then that caused her an inheritance tax problem in the future. What happened next? This is a true story, by the way. I'm not making this up. What happened next? About a couple of years after uh, the dad had died, uh, she was down at the bingo because she liked her bingo, uh, and she actually won the national bingo prize. She just she won two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Um, so quite rightly, she was very excited. Uh, she decided to head off to Florida to celebrate her win, which she did. Uh, but unfortunately, when she was in Florida, she died in her sleep. Uh, and then we had to repatriate her back to the UK. The reason I'm telling you that is because this was just a normal family. Dad was just a normal person. He had got a will in place, which was fantastic. He made his daughter executor. He made his daughter the beneficiary. Absolutely perfect tick. That's step one that I talked about earlier, making the will. What the solicitor didn't do with dad that wrote his will initially um, was plan for the future, which is step two and step three. If you remember, I said, 
what effect will that have on your beneficiaries? If we hadn't have done the deed of variation, set up a wheel trust out of dad's money for the benefit of the daughter, Jean, um, when she died out of his money, we would have paid the chancellor 55,000 pounds in tax. By doing the will trust, which cost her less than a thousand pounds, um, effectively she saved the family 54,000 pounds. Okay, um, so step three is where does the money end up? Well, in this case, 55,000 pounds would have ended up with the Chancellor of the Exchequer. So it's basically what we're doing is we're thinking for you. We just need to know what your situation is. We talk it through and then we'll plan your situation going forward. Other solicitors should do that as well, but we know from experience not that they're doing anything wrong, because they're not. You came in for a will, they're getting a will done for you. Um, but if you don't discuss your circumstances and they're not of the mind of thinking like we are, because uh, that's what we do for a living, um, then they may not pick up on things like uh, the, the trust. There's also uh, another trust, which I'm going to talk about in a second. So um, that's effectively the, uh, the, the will. Um, our model, business model is quite unique. We uh, do a free will service. Uh, yes, I'll say that again. We do a free will service. Uh, we've been doing it since 1984. Uh, all we ask is that you consider making a donation to a charity of your choice. So obviously, in the case of today, you can either make your donation to the uh, City and Hackney Carers Trust, or maybe you might want to give some to St. Joseph's Hospice, as they recommended it in the first place, your choice, or someone else. That, that's your choice. Um, you decide how much the, the donation is. We don't dictate that. Uh, for interest, an average uh, will is about £150. If you do a, a pair of wills for a couple, it will be probably about £240, £250. Um, so you decide that. And as I said, we, we raise a, a, a lot of money for charity. Last year, we gave £300,000 to charities from people writing their wills um, out of the kindness of our hearts. Even though we were struggling like everyone else, we still gave our donations over to charities. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, the clients that came to see us, and there was an average of 800 appointments a month we're doing during lockdown, um, uh, £38 million was raised in gifts and wills for charity as well. So it's a, it's a great cause. Um, so that's uh, effectively a will. Um, one thing I'm going to mention is a will review, um, because there may be people in the room today that have done their wills. So well done. That's excellent. Um, uh, I'm not going to embarrass Primilla by asking if she's done hers yet. Um, oh, I can see her reaction there. Um, but there will be people in the room that have done their wills. So that's very, very good. Uh, what I would suggest you do is review your situation and review your will on a, a regular basis. Regular, what's regular mean? Five, ten years, I would suggest. Um, when I meet a client and I sign off the will, I always say, um, just keep in touch. Don't, don't, don't just leave it till the end um, for two reasons. Firstly, circumstances may change during your lifetime. Executors may change. Beneficiaries may change. You may fall out with people. And trust me, lots of families fall out with each other. Um, uh, so come and see us and we'll just review things, make sure that everything in the will is correct. But more importantly, it's reviewing your situation. OK, it's not reviewing the will document itself. It's reviewing your situation and making sure that you have the right plans in place for the future. Um, and effectively, a will review is looking at your some circumstances and then dictating whether that's the right thing going forward. Um, I'm going to give you another a quick story on this, because I think this, again, just re relates to lots of people, because lots of people, lots of people are, are, are couples and married. Um, I appreciate not everyone is. So apologies if you're not, if, if you're listening in. Um, but this is a story about, again, I'm going to use myself as an example. So effectively, um, I'm happy. Uh, my wife's happy. Our children are all happy at the moment. OK, things do change, but everything's happy at the moment. Um, I'm quite rightly leaving all my money to wife. She's leaving everything to me. And then when the second of us goes, it will go down to the children. So what happens in this situation then? I die and I leave all my money to my wife. I'm very happy with that. No issue with that at all. Um, she then gets lonely uh, or meets someone else on, on a night out or whatever um, and starts uh, living with someone else. I have no issue with that. I'm not here. I can't be jealous anymore. Um, my kids might not be happy about it. But that's another story. Um, so she's basically now living with someone else. She then uh, remarries and marries this new chap. What happens to the will that she had when she was married to me? 
answers on a postcard. Basically, it's defunct. She's remarried. The will's not valid anymore. So effectively, she has to write a new will. Will she think about that? Unsure. Um, what happens then if she dies next? Uh, who has the claim on her estate? Effectively, her husband has got a claim on her estate. Um, and effectively, if all the money then goes to him, even if she did have a will, this is very possible. They could have rewritten wills. Um, they both left it to each other and then to children. She dies next. He has always hated my children, but didn't say it when she was alive. And then he rewrites his will. So basically, he disinherits my children. How much claim do my children have on that estate? Zero, because they're not linked. They're not blood linked. So they would have no legal claim on that estate at all. And that's just a situation that's quite normal, by the way. It can happen quite easily. Um, and it even happens where we have older uh, clients that are being influenced by the other children, if you know what I mean. So if he had children, um, he might get old and then his, uh, he's being influenced by, by his children. Uh, well, we don't ever see them anymore. So why are you leaving money to them, as in referring to my kids? So there's a little situation for you. So um, it's very important to, to look at those situations. What we would do in that situation is uh, advise that you take what is called a family protection trust. Again, I don't have time today to talk about it in detail, but basically it's a lifetime trust. You set it up during your lifetime. So it means that we always protect your 50% of assets, even though you're not here anymore. We still protect it for your benefit and for your beneficiaries in the future. Um, the other there's two big advantages with with a family protection trust. If you're doing it for those reasons, um, is that when you die, your money doesn't die with you. It stays alive in the cloud that I talked about, so you don't go through the probate process. So there's no probate fees, and no probate hassle. Uh, and the second benefit is if you set up a trust for for good reason, um, and you happen to go into a care home later in life, you will not be paying care home fees. And the reason you're not paying care home fees is because effectively you put your money into a trust. It's not your money anymore. It's now trust money for your benefit when you're living. But when you when you go into a care home, basically they can't take that money because it's protected in the trust. I will be very loud about this now. You cannot set up a trust to avoid care home fees. I'm going to repeat that. You cannot set up a trust to avoid care home fees. So please don't mishear what I said there. Um, we have to set up the trust for other reasons. Um, but that's what we worry about. We sort it out for you. So that's basically uh, Will's Will Reviews. Uh, I'm gonna now I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to move on to Power of Attorney. Um, power of Attorney is uh, effectively what it says on the tin. What you're doing is you're giving power to an attorney to act for you. Um, lots of people know what, well, everyone knows what a will is, but not everyone knows what a power of attorney is. So will is for when you die you set it up now but obviously it doesn't come into effect until you die a power of attorney is you set it up now and it is for now it's for whilst you're living so just like a will um you're basically in order to decide who who looks after you but you can't look after yourself um the will the, the power of attorney process is a two-stage two-stage process the first part of the the process is setting up the legal deed which is the paperwork and then the second part of the process is registering it with the Office of Public Guardian. So it becomes live and the, the, the attorneys can act for you. You do not need to do both at the same time. We meet many a client that have set up power of attorney and they've also registered it when they actually didn't need to. Um, and that means that they pay the registration fees and they've got people acting for them when actually they're absolutely fine and they have no need for people to act for them. Um, so. Our recommendation is based on circumstances, so we will we'll let you know whether we think you should register or not, but it is your choice at the end of the day. You, you decide whether you want it registered or not, okay? Um, so power of attorney, there's two parts to it in England. There's the financial and property, and there's the health and welfare, um, and you're setting up those two. You don't have to set them both up. You can just do one if you want and leave the other one for now. Um, if you're a couple, uh, you can, do it both at the same time, or if one's older than the other and needs it now, then, then you can set one up and not the other. It's your choice. Um, in my view, everyone over the age of 50 should have a power of attorney. Um, effectively, it's like an insurance policy. 
I suspect everyone in the room today will have house insurance, they'll have car insurance, they'll have, well, they would have had travel insurance if we were allowed to travel, but uh, when times come back, we will have travel insurance. Um, so it's like that. Effectively, what you're doing is you're making sure that when you're not able to look after yourself, whether that's physically or and or mentally, uh, then that means someone else can do things for you. So you're allowing your attorneys to do things for you, um, means that they can do banking for you, um, they can obviously do uh, the, the health and welfare decisions for you, etc. Um, my view is uh, that I said, depending on your age, you would register it. So uh, if you were getting old and you need people to help you, like children or, or friends, good friends, always make sure it's someone you trust, by the way, that, that gets your power of attorney. Um, so usually it's close family or, or very close friends. Uh, then make sure you, you, you get that uh, registered if you're later on in life and you need that help. If you're not and you're young, like some of us in the room, um, then you might want to just delay the registration part. Um, what happens if you don't have a power of attorney in place? I can hear some of you possibly asking. Um, I'm going to give you a story for this to put it into perspective. Um, I was down in Neath and Port Talbot uh, about two years ago, meeting clients from, again, one of our charity partners down there, Age Connects. Um, and nearly all the time, people coming into the room to see me are effectively setting up a will and power of attorney. Um, but on this one occasion, a woman came in and she says, hi, um, introduce ourselves. Uh, and I assumed wrongly, uh, are you in doing your will today? Oh, no, 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 I'm not in for me. I'm in for my mum. I said, all right, OK, no problem. Um, she said, I'm just in here to get my, a power of attorney for my mum. I said, yeah, we can do that for you. Uh, is your mum coming through now? Is she maybe at the, in the ladies' room? Oh, no, 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 she's not with me today. I said, right, okay, where is your mum? Oh, she's up at the care home. And this was her exact words. So I've never forgotten this. She's away with the fairies. She's in the care home. I said, all right, okay, that's very sad. Um, when you say she's away with the fairies, does that mean she still has capacity or she lost capacity? Oh, no, no, no. She wouldn't be able to tell you what day of the week it was. I said, well, that's very sad. Um, and you wanted me to set up the power of attorney at any particular reason? Yeah, because there's bills that need paying. Um, she's got things that are, you know, letters that are coming that you're acting on and people are not allowing me to do it on her behalf because I'm not her power of attorney. Um, I said, well, I've got some sad news for you as well, unfortunately. Uh, I can't set you up a power of attorney for your mum. She has to set that up. She has to give you that instruction. Um, you can imagine what the reaction to that was. There was tears for the next five, 10 minutes. Uh, we got over that. Um, the good news is we can do what is called a deputy ship in England and Wales. Um, so it's like a power of attorney, but unfortunately it costs more money um, and uh, it's a lot more onerous for the people that are deputies. Um, so my recommendation without going into too much detail is that if uh, you think uh, you need a power of attorney, then that means you need one. Um, uh, if you're over the age of 50, even 60, even 70, the older you get, the more likely you are to need the power of attorney. I would just get on with it uh, and don't go down the, the debt to ship route because you won't be going down the debt to ship route. Someone else will be having to do it on your behalf. And it's a lot of grief and a lot of hassle for them. Um, we are probably doing about 400 uh, power of attorneys a month. So give you a scale of how many we do. Um, so we are able to keep our prices extremely low. Um, we did a market uh, analysis a few years ago and we worked out that the, the average price for a power of attorney is about £350 or there or thereabouts. Um, and you need two in England, one for the financial property and one for the health and welfare. Um, so obviously that's something like £700 for a pair of power of attorneys. Um, we do ours for £249 and we include the welfare power of attorney for free. Yeah, I did say that correctly, so I'm going to repeat it. We do the financial and property power of attorney for £249, and we include the welfare power of attorney for free. So all you pay is £249. That includes the VAT. It does not include the registration fees. Um, uh, I haven't registered one just in the recent time, but last time I looked, it was about £110. It might have gone up by a few pounds. It might come down. I think it might even come down, actually. Um, so... Uh, I don't know if anyone can help me with that registration fee, if anyone's done one recently. Um, so effectively, the registration fee is per, per, per power. So there's a, a couple of you. You're going to pay two, four, nine each, and then 
the, 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 the registration fees times four to, to register all four pair of attorneys. Um, as I said before, you don't need to register them. You could register them at a later date when, when you actually needed them. Um, if you uh, um, do a power of attorney with us, we donate £30 to charity out of our fee. Um, so that's, that's good as well. So that's um, power of attorney. Uh, very simply, it's you uh, giving power to your attorneys to act for you when you've maybe lost capacity. Um, bear in mind, there are things that people do that they shouldn't be doing. Um, I remember many years ago, I met someone, oh, I don't need one of those. My mum just gives me her banking card and I just go down to the bank and get the money out for her. I said, all right, okay. Well, it's a good thing I want the policy then, isn't it? Um, because that's not legal. Um, you should not be drawing money out of your mum's account, um, even with her permission. Um, she definitely wouldn't be able to do that if she walked into the bank and asked for the money, that's for sure. Um, so bear that in mind. It's, it's, it's worth getting it sorted out. Uh, there's two things you definitely sort out. One's your will and one's your power of attorney. Um, and then subject to your circumstances, there may be other things that, that we would recommend as well. As you can tell, I love talking. So I'm now gonna stop for a second because um, I noticed that's now my 40 minutes up. Um, I'm gonna take a wee sip of my drink. And Primella, I'll take the questions now. Do I just, uh, I just presume I can just scroll up to the top and then just answer them as they come, yeah. <clears throat> okay, the first one is just introducing me. Next one is the microphone. Okay. Now, funny enough, on my notes here, I do have a big script about uh, inheritance tax, but normally I don't have time to do that. So um, I have covered um, inheritance tax. This is Aziz that's asked the question, inheritance tax, a little information, please. Um, very simply, um, you might have heard me saying earlier about lifetime allowance. We all have a lifetime allowance of 325,000 pounds. So obviously, I don't know what Aziz's situation is, and we don't want to ask her because I don't think we get personal on, on panels like this. Um, but if Aziz is married, then that means that you both have a £325,000 allowance. And if you're a married couple, um, you have the uplift of your partner. So if I die tomorrow, my wife gets my £325,000 allowance. So we die with a, both die with a £650,000 allowance. Just to confuse matters, and I'm not gonna to go too much into detail here, there's called something called the residence nil rate band, and that gives you an additional allowance. So effectively, it means that you get 350,000 as a couple or 175,000 as an individual extra allowance if you have children and or grandchildren if the children have died. And if you have property up to the value of the allowance, um, then you potentially can have up to a million pounds or 500,000 of your single uh, allowance in, in inheritance tax. It's all very complicated. Um, what I would suggest, there's lots of things that we do to help uh, our inheritance tax clients. Um, and there's lots more of them now than they used to be because the property prices have, have climbed quite dramatically, especially in the, in the London area. Um, what we can do for you is we do what is called a calculation report. Uh, we do not charge for the calculation report. So basically you would contact us and ask us for a calculation report for inheritance tax. We will do the calculation for you. And then if you want a solution report whereby we give you a solution, there is a fee of 200 pounds to prepare a solution report for you. So that's all I'm gonna say on inheritance tax because it is a complex subject and I don't want people to fall asleep on me. Um, and, and uh, lose the track. So that's hopefully uh, enough disease to answer your question. Um, can someone with early dementia make a will? Absolutely, they can. Uh, dementia is a progressive disease. Alzheimer's is obviously one of those uh, diseases. Um, so effectively, uh, when you come to see me, I will dictate whether you have capacity to give me will instructions. If I'm not happy, that you are not with me and you do not understand what I'm talking about and you don't answer questions correctly, then I would not take a will instruction. Okay, we are anal about it at McClure Solicitors because it's our main business and we can't afford to be doing wills for people that shouldn't be giving will instructions because they don't have the capacity to do so. It's possible you may go to another solicitor and they might take your will instruction. That's up to them. 
it's them that's going to be at the court at the end of the day if there's a contentious probate and they would have to show uh, their notes and attendance notes of what happened on that day and what was involved in that conversation so absolutely yes uh, um, my auntie uh, got diagnosed with uh, dementia just before Christmas but she's normal there's nothing wrong with it at the moment so she would be quite capable of giving a will instruction however maybe in a period of time I don't want to say a time because that's, that might dictate what's going to happen um, but you know she may get to a stage where she's not uh, got the capacity to give me uh, uh, an instruction same principle for a power attorney Again, I would make sure I'm comfortable that you have capacity to understand what I'm talking about. That you're able to take on board what you're deciding. And also I'll be asking questions to make sure that you understand. I had a, this, that's, so that's from, well, that's from Pramila. Thank you, Pramila. Um, next one is from, uh, I think it's a Donald. Uh, the word is all one, but I'm sure it's Donald. That's the, the person that's asking the question. I had a will made out in the 1990s. Is it still valid? I'm going to give you two answers to that. Yes, it is valid if it's valid in the first place. OK, and the reason I'm saying that is because some people have wills sitting in their drawers that are not wills. Example, real story. Went to a client of mine who was doing a will review because they said, oh, we did our wills years ago. We want to review it. Yeah, no problem. So I went into the house. Uh, I did the will review with them, um, changed everything that they want to change. And at the end of the meeting, I said, just out of interest, can I just have a quick read of your old will to make sure that I've covered things that maybe you decided many years ago that you've forgotten to tell me about on this occasion? So they went into the drawer and they got out this beautiful bound will with silk and everything. It was absolutely gorgeous. I said, oh, my goodness, this will cost you a few quid. Just by looking at it, you knew it cost money. And they said, oh, yeah, it was about 300 pounds that we paid for that. I said, oh, my goodness. Well, you got good value for money because the, the will looks absolutely stunning. Um, so I opened up the will, I read it through, and then guess what happened? It wasn't a will. And why wasn't it a will? Normally I'd have people shouting back at me now, give me the answers. The answer was, it wasn't signed, it wasn't witnessed, and it wasn't dated. That had been sitting in their house for decades. So, and he was a, I'm not going to tell you the company, but he was a director of a very, very big retail store in the UK. Um, and spent his life traveling around the world. Um, and yet he thought he had his will sitting there and he didn't. We well, did, but it wasn't a will. So the question is, is it still valid on the assumption that you had it witnessed and signed and dated correctly? Um, yes, it is still valid. OK, I take a new will would override all previous. Yes. Basically, when you write a new will, you revoke, revoke all old wills. That's part of the wording that comes in a will. So by you signing that new will, you're revoking all previous uh, testimonies. Also, this was a will made in the USA. OK, I've not read the la last part of the question there. It's not valid, no, because it's, in, it's a USA will. It's not a UK will. So it depends on where your assets are. So, Donald, if your assets are in the UK, you need a UK will. You also need a USA will if you've got assets in the USA, I assume. I'm not an expert on USA law, so I don't know whether that is the case or not. I'm assuming it will be something similar to our law. Um, if your assets are in this country, you should have a will here as well, just to make that clear. So I go back on my question, answer, no, it's not valid in the UK, but it probably is valid in the USA, but I'm not a USA expert. So please take advice from a legal advisor in the USA. Okay, next one. Um, next one, Aziz, are there different types of LPAs? I think I've probably answered that one. There's two types of LPA. There's the financial and property LPA. LPA stands for lasting power of attorney, in case anyone's wondering what LPA stands for. Um, and there's the health and welfare LPA. So yes, there are two types. And I think I've covered both of them. You don't need both of them. You could go for one and not the other. Uh, but I would recommend you get both. Uh, and then you're sorted. You only need to do it once. That's it. It's not like insurance. You have to renew it every year. Uh, you buy it once and it's sorted. Um, OK, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, the talk has been, oh, OK, that's just Pramila telling everyone about the recording. Um, how do I obtain a power of attorney? Sorry, I missed the beginning of the session. I've got a feeling Pramila introduced it by saying I was going to talk about power of attorneys and then wills, and I did it the other way around. So hopefully, Elim, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, uh, you did 
hear about my power of attorney's presentation because it came at the end. So please come back to me if I haven't. Um, and then said, not done that yet, but I think I have. So, Anne, do you think I've done it since you said that? Yeah, I have. Okay, I'm seeing a nodding. Yes, you have. <laughs> uh, do everyone forced to have LPA on? Do everyone forced to have LPA? Um, you're not, I don't know how to re read that question. Do everyone forced to have LPA? You don't need an LPA, that's your choice. Uh, you don't have to, no one can force you to have an LPA, just to be absolutely clear, it's your choice whether you do an LPA or not. Hopefully that answers that question. If it's not, please rewrite it for me. Um, what is probate? Yeah, good question. Probate, uh, sorry, sometimes I use a legal terminology and people are going, what is he talking about? Um, probate is effectively when you die, um, your estate, which is all the, the, the assets that you have, property, money, savings, etc., cetera, um, is gathered up and that becomes your estate. And in order for it to be paid out to your beneficiaries, which you name in your will, you have to go through probate. It's a legal process where basically uh, the probate department then stamps a document to say, yes, that's all kosher uh, and that money can now be distributed to your beneficiaries. Um, normally it is a solicitor that does probate. People can do it themselves if they wish. Um, I did have a lady once that I said to her, um, you know, when you die, obviously, uh, we'll have your will, so we'll make sure that everything is sorted. We don't need to do it, by the way. Your executives could do it if they wish, or they can take it to another firm of solicitors. That's not a problem. Oh, no, no, don't worry. I'll do my own probate. I said, oh, will you? I said, well, you're the first client I've ever met that can do their own probate. Well, I did my dad, so why can't I do mine? I said, well, shall I remind you of something? You'll be dead. So how do you intend doing your probate? Oh, yes, she says, that's a good point. <laughs> So you can't do your own probate, guys, okay? Someone needs to do it for you. So it might be your husband or your wife or your children or your solicitor, but yeah. So probate is basically winding up your estate um, and there's usually a legal fee associated with that to, to, to pay out to the solicitor if, if you want them to do it for you. Who can sign the power of attorney form? Okay, so the power of attorney is gonna be signed by you because you are giving the power of attorney and any of your attorneys that you're nominating, okay? So basically anyone involved in that power of attorney would need to sign the form. And there's different parts of the form that they sign, um, but effectively they're the people that sign it, okay? Um, that uh, next one is from Luxme. How can I contact the solicitors as I'm setting all this up now? When you say the solicitors, I'm assuming you mean McClure solicitors because you've been so impressed with this talk today. Um, if it is, then our number, everyone got their pen and paper ready? Um, the number is a free phone number, so it doesn't even cost you to make a call, is 0800 852 1999. I'll just repeat that, 0800 852 1999, that's 1999. Remember that, that was the good year, wasn't it? Um, so if you do want to contact the close listers, that is our phone number, it's a free phone number. Um, if you just mention uh, that you have been listening to a talk today by Adrian from McClure Solicitors and you're from the uh, city and city of London Hackney Care Centre, that's right, isn't it? Yeah, um, they'll obviously make a note of that. £82, thank you very much, Anne. Yeah, it used to be 110 and it went down, that's correct. Um, so yeah, that's £82, that figure relates to the registration fee for each power of attorney. Okay. Okay, YouTube, that's basically uh, this recording that's going to go out on YouTube, so I'm going to become famous. I even put my tie on today for that, so hopefully I look nice and smart. Um, where do you register the LPA? Well, normally uh, the uh, solicitor that's doing the uh, LPA for you will do that on your behalf. You basically just go and see the solicitor, give the instructions, they'll do everything for you. Um, but if you're doing it yourself, then it's the Office of Public Guardian that you register it with. Okay. Um, and Anissa, can you, can I put that on, let me, can I put that on Facebook? Just wanted to say that was the most informative and clear talk about this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. That's very kind of you to say that. Um, as couples, do you need LPA? I'll go back to my, in fact, I'm going to go back to a client here, a real story. I went to, we have a, a a charity partner called Age Concern Central Lancashire. So I was doing uh, appointments in Preston and a couple came in to see me 
the charity had set up the room in a community centre, which was absolutely lovely. But what I didn't know when we set up the room was there would be a Zumba class next door. So I was trying to take well instructions of the Zumba class next door, going all doing the noise and dancing and everything, or whatever you do at a Zumba class, I've never done one. Um, and uh, they came in to give their will and, and power of attorney instructions. Uh, I thought it was very really strange because they were a very nice couple, very smart, and they came in the room and uh, we shook hands and introduced ourselves. And then before we sat down, the gentleman straightened my tie. Now, for anyone that's noticed, my tie is always like that. It doesn't need straightening. It's always proper. Um, I have a military uh, forces background with my dad, so I knew how to do a tie. Um, and I thought, well, that's a very strange thing to do. No one's ever done that to me apart from my dad when I was a wee boy. So we sat down, we started talking, and I noted that she was doing all the talking. Mrs. was doing all the talking. And I thought, right, I need to start changing the, the tack here and start talking to the gentleman. Um, and I, he was, he could talk, no problem at all. But actually, when we talk about, when we spoke about details, um, he wasn't with me. He, he just wasn't with me at all. So I then started just asking questions in a very nice way. I'm not, no one knows I'm testing them, but I am testing them. Um, just remind me again what your children's names. Couldn't tell me. Had no idea what his children's names were. Um, and then I asked a few other questions. Trump had just become president at the time. So he was talk of the town. So I said, well, by the way, uh, you've been watching the news about the new presidents and the stuff. Oh, yeah, it's been amazing, hasn't it? What's his name again? Couldn't tell me what his name was. And yet he was the focal news, every news news uh, thing. So there's lots of things I'll talk to them about. And then I look back to, to the wife uh, and she was literally tears coming out of her eyes. And she says, I'm really sorry, but I should have said something to you. But he, he's he's got he's had dementia diagnosed many years ago and I, I think uh, he's just not I said no that's normal I'm, it's not a problem unfortunately I can't take his power of attorney today I can take your power of attorney I can't take his um, mm -hmm. so as couples absolutely you should have power of attorney both of you um, don't leave it too late that one loses their capacity and then the other one uh, can't get it sorted all right next question is I have I have, and my brother has a will in 2002, and seconds are not changed. Oh, and I are still single, no children. I don't think so. so I okay, I'm assuming, Luxme, that you still you have the original will. You do. That's fine. I can. You're on my screen, so I can see you nodding. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, everything will be fine. Um, on on the assumption, like I go back to my previous response, that the will is correct and has been signed and witnessed and dated correctly. Uh, there should be absolutely no problem with that. I can still, I can see that you're still very, very young. Um, so what I would suggest is, no, yes. Um, uh, my my eldest client I ever took an instruction from was 102, and that was the first time they wrote a will. Um, so you've got a long way to go, Luxme. Um, but no, you're absolutely fine. All I would say is that if your circumstances change, i.e. the things that are in your will, um, then you should come and talk to someone, come and talk to us. Uh, we're gonna be around for, for many hundreds of years yet. Okay. Um, the other thing you might want to, depending on circumstances, um, it's not, I said at the very beginning, a will is a wish of where you want your assets to go. A will doesn't always dictate what happens as I gave some examples and stories earlier. Um, so sometimes a trust is, is better to protect your assets going forward, but we can talk about that if you want to. Um, how do you make a jointly owned property where the two owners are related but not partners? What needs to be done? Blah, blah, blah. Basically, uh, you need to make sure that the title on your property, um, I'm going to read that again. Sorry, Susan, I just muttered that. How do you manage a jointly owned property where the two owners are related but not partners? What needs to be in a will for both parties? Well, effectively, you need to make sure, more importantly, forget the will for a second, that your title is correct because a title supersedes anything. So your title of the property needs to be correct. So you need to make sure that whatever you want the title to say is, is correct. Um, effectively, you can be tenants in common or you can be joint title. Um, depending on your circumstances, one or t'other will suit. I'm not gonna go into more detail on that today. Um, and then when you're writing your will, you just need to make sure that you're leaving your assets. Now you can either leave a house legacy. So you might have family. I'm gonna make something up here. You, this partner, you say partner, didn't you? Yeah. So they might not be husband or 
or wife, I don't know if you're talking about yourself or someone else here, um, and you might want to leave all your assets to your family and not the partner, but you want to leave his property to him because it is his property effectively. Um, so we would have to think about how we write the will in that situation. Normally a will, a normal will would suffice, basically leaving all your assets to each other, that suffices, that, 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 that does the trick. Um, but there may be more complications than that, depending on who else is involved. Okay. Um, oh my goodness, I've still got loads of questions. Uh, I'm going to move a bit faster now. Am I okay for time, guys? Um, Adrian, I just wanted to say it's nearly th it's three o'clock now. Are you okay to carry on or yeah. do you want to? I'm happy to finish off the questions. It's not a problem. Thank so you. Thank you. Hear everything. I'll just go a bit quicker. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Um, right. Next question from Margaret. Um, Although I just noticed it says direct message, so maybe I shouldn't say it's from Margaret. So I'm going to move on and I'll come back to that one and not say who it's from. Um, Lux me, uh, my brother is waiting a capacity report. However, he has capacity. He can still make a new will and can we carry out the power of attorney? Uh, yeah, basically you can do you can do a will or power of attorney as long as you've got capacity. Sometimes uh, the solicitors will ask for a doctor's report on this. Um, but it is down to the solicitor at the end of the day to make that final decision because it's not the doctor necessarily that's going to be at the stand at the contentious probate court um, that, that's relevant. It's going to be what we wrote down on our, on our attendance notes that day. Okay. How are you working at the moment? Are you doing your instruction? Yeah, good question from Anne. Um, since uh, March last year, she's asking how we take instructions at the moment. Um, we have been operating on video call. So there are many platforms that we can operate from. One of them is Zoom. Uh, we can also do WhatsApp. We can also do Skype. Um, so effectively, if you want to make an appointment, unfortunately, as current things currently stand, we cannot see you face to face, i.e. we cannot meet you in an office. We cannot meet you at home. We cannot meet you at the carer center. So we're doing all our appointments either via video call uh, on one of the platforms I just mentioned, or we can do a telephone appointment if you don't have that facility. About 90% of our clients in the last year have been doing video calls. So I think most people can do a video call. You can even do it on your mobile phone. It doesn't need to be a big posh computer. Um, also, we are able to do the signing of the will via uh, a video call as well. That's been uh, an exception made by the government. So we can do a will signing on the video call. Unfortunately, the government doesn't, didn't make a power of attorney the same process. Strange enough, we have been corresponding. Our managing director is a, a committee member on the Parliamentary Review Committee, um, and he was in con, uh, communication with Lord Blunkett this week, uh, trying to get the government to review their situation on power of attorney. Uh, they are looking at that for us. Um, so fingers crossed, we might get them to change their mind on power of attorney as well. So power of attorney still has to be done. We would send you the papers. You would need to get that done yourself. Will will do on, on the video. Okay. So can I I'm just reading this next one, so bear with me. So can I ask? Yeah, so basically, um, I think I've answered the question, Anisa, about signing and witnessing a will. We'll do it on the video with you. Okay. So effectively, um, in England you need two witnesses. So we will be the two witnesses. I would be on the video, and one of my colleagues would join me on the video, you would be at the other end of the video and we would watch you sign your will and we're now witnessing your will being signed. Okay, so that's how we do it. Um, if it's not us and there's other solicitors involved that you're talking to, they might not be able to do it like that for some reason. Uh, if they can't, they can obviously send the will out to you. And as long as you get two witnesses to, to witness your signature and they have to witness when you're signing, by the way, you can't sign it and then pop around to the neighbors to get them to witness it. You, they have to witness your signature. That's what the witness is doing. OK, so you don't need to mix um, what we have done in a few extreme cases um, is we've done what we call car bonnet signings. So as long as you're outside the building and you're two meters apart, then there's no reason why you couldn't do a car bonnet signing. OK, hopefully that answers that question. I think Mar Margaret, I think that says um, who can sign the form, I think of answered those questions for both will and power of attorney, so I'll move on. Maureen, uh, my husband has vascular dementia, vascular, excuse me, dementia. I think I need to get power of attorney, but do not know if you'll be able to do it. What can I do? Very simple answers to that, Maureen. Either contact us 
uh, or contact another solicitor because um, I think you should do it with a solicitor in this situation um, uh, and uh, they will make the decision. They will meet you, your husband, and they'll, they'll, they'll give you an answer to that, okay? Um, the next question is, when you uh, live in council house, do you need one? Um, I'm not quite sure what one refers to, so I'm going to answer for both will and power of attorney. Yes, for both. Just because you live in a council home doesn't exclude you. Um, you're like one of us. You need a will because it doesn't mean you might not own your property, but you'll have other assets that you own that you want to pass on to, to your beneficiaries. And power of attorney is exactly the same. Uh, you want someone to be able to make decisions for you, do your banking for you. Bills might need paying. Um, because you own a council house doesn't mean say you don't have bills, you still have bills, and you might end up in a hospital one day and you want someone to make decisions for you, even at end of life, you might want someone to make decisions for you. So the power of attorney uh, the, can do that for you, okay? Okay, next one is my mum has dementia, I was advised to get power of attorney. Is this necessary and how does one go about getting one? I think I've answered all those questions. So you just need to call that number I gave you earlier uh, or contact another solicitor. I don't want to take all the all the glory here. Um, hi, will you be leaving your details after this meeting? OK, um, I think I've given you my phone number. So I hope you've all got the phone number. That's uh, a free phone number to our appointment setting. Um, I will also be supplying uh, Pramila with uh, some notes of this meeting afterwards, so she will be emailing that out. I am actually going, or should have been in a board meeting six, weeks, six minutes ago, so it won't be straight after this meeting, but I will get it to you uh, after that. They are aware that I might be late, so don't worry about that. Um, phone number, it says phone number again, please. So I'm gonna say it again, as someone's asked that. It's 0800 852 one triple nine okay that's the phone number the name of the solicitors is, is mcclure it's m c c l u r e mcclure solicitors just so you know to give you because obviously you might not have heard of us before that's quite normal because you don't tend to have national brands of solicitors um we work with uh, over 200 well, 206 charities now we work with um and the biggest charity we work with, and we do literally thousands of appointments every year for them. You might have heard of them. They're called Macmillan Cancer Support. So we're one of their panel uh, solicitors. So just so you know that you're dealing with a very reputable company. Um, uh, I don't think you can get much uh, better reference than Macmillan Cancer Support. We're one of their panel solicitors that look after all their clients for needing wills and power of attorneys and other things. Um, that's then all the praise coming in. That's very nice, thank you. Um, someone says, do I need a solicitor? I don't know what the question for that means. I don't know what that means. Do I need a solicitor? It depends what your problem is. Um, or you, may, you might not just have a problem. You might just be asking for your will or power of attorney. You do not, you, you do not need to leave, so I'll start again. You do not need a, to use a solicitor to make a will or a power of attorney, just to be absolutely clear on that. But would you fix your own car? If you're saying yes, you would fix your own car, then write your own will and write your own power of attorney. If you use a mechanic to fix your car, then you should use a solicitor to do your will and power of attorney. Hopefully that doesn't sound too cheeky, um, but I'm just saying it as it is. You're using a solicitor because that's what they're experienced in doing, um, but you, there are self-help packs in WH Smith where you can get a will and, and, and do your own will. You can do your own power of attorney as well, but you're not getting the legal advice. That's the important thing. Um, about your circumstances and if things go wrong in the future there's no comeback because you wrote it okay at least with the solicitor you've got to come back as a solicitor to support you okay um, thank you Aziz you put the number on the screen that's excellent um, I think I've done that right my mother had a yeah, you're, uh, uh, Alison, yes, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Unfortunately, that's the worst case scenario, but that is unfortunately the only way you can go uh, is court of protection and deputy ship. It's a shame the power of attorney wasn't done first, but hopefully that's a wake up call for, if you don't mind me saying, Alison, that's a wake up call for everyone on the call today. Um, that's what happens, unfortunately, if, if you don't have a power of attorney in place, you have to go through the court of protection for a deputy ship. Um, it is 
we're not going to ask Alison how much it's costing, but it won't be cheap. Um, and what's worse is that uh, you have to keep the court informed of what you're doing going forward with the power of attorney. You don't need to do that. Um, okay. This is just thanks. Thanks. Uh, my mum made a will. I says I was when she didn't, which she doesn't know want to keep now. Okay, someone's asking, this is Michelle. Uh, my mum has made a will, but she doesn't want it now. She wants to make a new one. Absolutely no problem at all. Um, she brought a will form from the internet and wants to write it herself. She can't go back to the solicitor. Okay, just to make it clear, if you write a will with solicitor, so if you wrote a will with McClure solicitors today, and then in 10 years time, you want to go somewhere else, that's absolutely fine. You don't need to come back to us and tell us, okay? When you write a will, a new will, you don't need to go back and tell the, the, the solicitor. Um, you just get on and do what you want to do. Yes, you can do online wills. Guess what? We're going to be launching an online will probably about April time because times are moving uh, and lots of people now want to do wills online. So we're going to be different though. We're going to do the online will whereby you'll do the online will online, but when you come to sign the will, you'll be doing it with us. So it's the best of both worlds. You can do it in your own time online, but we're making sure that you're signing that and witnessing it properly um, because that's where the problems come. Um, again, that's just thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Okay, Aziz, I think you've been my most popular asker of questions today, so thank you. Um, uh, no, we don't do with deal with party wall issues. I'm sure there are lots of solicitors in City of London and Hackney that will. Um, we, what, what you tend to find with solicitors, we specialise in certain fields and we specialise in estate planning, which is uh, um, what we've talked about today. Okay, and no, not the Prescription Act either. Um, yeah, I think that's me answered all the questions and Maureen has signed off. So bye, Maureen. Thank you so much for um, explaining lasting power of attorney and will writing. We really do appreciate it. So, yeah, thank you so much. And you're thank very, very you going welcome. over the time. <laughs> no, yeah, you're very welcome. Hopefully we've made a few people think today. Um, and uh, please, please get in contact either with us or with your own solicitor to get, get yourself sorted out for will or power of attorney. I don't mind which one you use because I just want you to get yourself sorted out. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll send out some notes. If people want to come back to me on a personal basis, just ask you know, personal questions about their situation. I'm more than happy to do that. Obviously, Pramila will give my details uh, when I send in the information. All right, then. Good. I think we're running a poll at the end of this for everybody that's joined in. If if Pramila's ready to set that up, just to say how it went. So okay, thank you I'll, very I'll, much. I, I won't answer the question because I might talk very good about myself. <laughs> well, I'm going to say goodbye. If that's okay. Bye. Pramila, Bye.